And my grandfather was in the military uh, army after World War I. And my father was in the Korean War as a combat infantryman. Was wounded in action and uh, had served with the 8th Regiment of the 1st Cavalry Division in uh, the Korean War. So uh, the Army was always something that was in the back of my mind, you know, growing up. And uh, when I was young, uh, Vietnam started. And uh, while I was growing up, Vietnam was still going on. And when I was 18, Vietnam was still going on. It was on the news all the time. I mean, uh, I knew when the 1st Cav was in the Yardrang Valley, you know, fighting those regiments of MVA, you know, in 65, I guess it was. Uh, I, I knew all that stuff. And uh, so uh, I decided instead of going to college, to, I would just uh, try my hand in the Army. So you enlisted? I did, 1971. I uh, did a summertime boot camp because I wasn't too uh, interested in trying to get warm. Uh, so three days after graduation, I was uh, heading for Fort Dix, New Jersey for, for basic training. Tough? It was, uh, well, I, I had played football in high school and stuff like that. It was just a little tougher than a football practice, but uh, it, it lasted a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I kind of knew what to expect. My father kind of told me, you know, like, that it was going to be rough and, and just go along with the program. And I, I had gotten a guarantee to a, uh, a radar repair school at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And it was a 42 week school. So it was one of their longest schools that the Army offered. All I had to do was fulfill my end of the bargain to uh, graduate basic training on the first try. Not to get recycled, in other words. So uh, that, was, that was behind my head a little bit. I got to get through this and, uh, you know, get, go on to my school and, and things will be good, you know. And uh, my father talked me into that electronic school because initially I wanted to fly helicopters. I think in that respect, he saved my life because uh, helicopter pilots, they, were, they weren't having a great time in Vietnam. It was good, I'll have to say. And uh, I went through the whole program at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. I became an air defense radar repairman, which uh, was actually one of the largest radars that the Army had, a search radar for the Nike Hercules system, which actually there was an active base at that time at Fort Hancock, New Jersey at Sandy Hook. And uh, once in a while, we would go there and, and see how the, the real army was protecting our country against uh, Russian aggression. Nike Hercules missiles were the real deal in those days. They were nuclear tip missiles, and they were long range. And they were designed to take out uh, formations of airplanes, not just singulars. So uh, initially, I did not get any orders from uh, my school. All the rest of my classmates went to places like Thule, Greenland, to the Dew Line, and places all over the world. And I was stuck in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey with no, no orders for anything. So I finally went to the uh, commander of the school and asked that him if, if they needed instructors. So I don't know, a week or two goes by and one of the orderlies came down from my company that I was in and said for me to go over to, to personnel and pick up my orders. I thought it was the orders for, for the signal school at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. It turned out to be orders for White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, <laughs> which I said to this guy, oh no, this is, these orders are wrong. I'm not supposed to be going to New Mexico to some missile range. And he goes, oh no, these are your orders, all right. You're going there. After a couple weeks leave, I reported to... Uh, uh, the, the airport at, for, for, uh, at El Paso, Texas. They had a, a desk there for uh, personnel because Fort Bliss is in El Paso. And so I went up to the military desk in the airport in El Paso and handed in my orders, uh, spec four there. And I told them I had to get out somehow to White Sands Missile Range. I had no idea where the heck it was. It was 60 miles in the desert 
um, from El Paso, Texas in, into New Mexico, southern New Mexico. And there's only one road there that goes there. It's called War Road. So he says, well, take your bags and sit over there. Somebody will come and get you eventually. So this guy shows up about two or three hours later, and I throw all my stuff in his car, and off we go. We're, we're going in the middle of nowhere. Mountains on the left, nothing on the right. And uh, I said to the guy, finally, I said, do you know where the hell you're going? He says, yeah, you see those lights way, way over there? And, yeah, that's where we're going. And I mean, it was nowhere. Because they don't fire missiles in the middle of people. <laughs> so that's kind of what it was. So I was stationed um, with a section that tracked the velocity and positioning of, of experimental missiles from the time of launch. And that's done with continuous wave radars and not the pulse radars that I was trained on at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And these continuous wave radars are, are mobile and they're very small. They look like Mickey Mouse ears. And uh, they were associated with the Hawk missile system. We towed those around and we tracked missiles right from where they were launched. So that became a little bit of a challenge from time to time because not all experimental missiles fly. <laughs> so we shot all of our missiles north because we didn't want to run them with the risk of them going into old Mexico. And a couple of them did. And anyway, they just turned right around and they ended up down there anyway. So that became interesting for the uh, recovery crews that had to go down there and pick up the pieces because number one, you're in a whole different country. Uh, the United States government was paying Mexico for a heck, a heck of a lot of prime farmland that they don't have that got blown up in uh, whoever, you know, whatever, you know. But to, we, we took uh, several trips to Utah to track Pershing missiles that the West Germans were firing, and they would, they would actually impact on the north range of White Sands Missile Range. So they were actually going through the, over the four corners of the southwest, and not too many people were aware of that at the time. But uh, I think the biggest city that was affected by those flights was uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. So we, I saw a lot of the southwest and, and got to California and all the way up the coast to um, Oregon and Washington State and then cut back through, you know. And it was an amazing experience because uh, I doubt that I would have that opportunity any other time. Right. Uh, we used to go to Juarez, Mexico quite a bit. Whenever a new guy would come into the unit, that's what we would do. We'd, we all end up, now Juarez was right outside of El Paso. And so that was a good 60, 65 miles possibly away, away from us. So we'd have to go there and we would always park on the El Paso side and walk over. And some of those trips back over the bridge there was <laughs> memorable, I'll say. <laughs> but uh, you know, in those days, even those days, the Federales in, in old Mexico carried around MP5 machine gun, machine pistols. And uh, once in a while from a block or two away, you hear this burp, burp. And I'd look at the guys, you know, by that time I was an old, old guy there and I'd say let it's time for us to head for the border boys you know <laughs> I don't know what that was but we're not gonna go get not we're, we're not getting involved with that you know uh, we don't have automatic weapons they do we're out so I did that for uh, two years and then uh, Got out. rotated out and came home and went to college on the GI Bill mm. first I went for electrical engineering and then I got into uh, audiovisual technology. I, I majored in photography. I ended up uh, starting a major appliance repair business with my father. That, that lasted 32 years. I've just retired two years ago. I did a good job of talking my youngest son out of going in the Army after 9-11. Um, I didn't do it on purpose. I just said to him, uh, if this is not something you feel that you can't live without doing, don't do it. Because if you're just doing it for the hell of it, it's not going to be fun. And it's not going to be the right thing for you to do. Um, initially, it wasn't a part of my plan to do any of this stuff with the veterans. Uh, but when I went to college at Alfred State College in upstate New York, 
there was a bar that I frequented that uh, there was a man there who was a Navy veteran. And there was a uh, American Legion post at Arkport, New York, which was a ways away from us. And he said to me one day, we were just having a beer, he says, did it ever occur to you to get in the American Legion? And I says, no, I don't have time for that nonsense I'm, you know, <laughs> right now. And, and he says, you know, a lot of people who just get out of the service think that way, but eventually you might realize there's a, there's a true benefit to it in many ways. And I have over the years, I've been a legionnaire now since 1975. Mm -hmm. So I have realized over all those decades that there is a true benefit to uh, the American Legion and certainly the other uh, you know, AMVETS and, and VFW and all of them. I mean, they all have their own um, agenda and they all do good things. Mm -hmm. So yes, I would say absolutely. Uh, when a young soldier or Marine or sailor, whoever it is, uh, has time to start thinking about these kinds of organizations, definitely do it.